Professor Fadon had uh, contacted us and me and asked me to give a short uh, perspectives on additive manufacturing talk. I know you've had some already. They probably ranged uh, in content quite a bit. Um, I kind of took it from an approach of a pseudo TED talk where I talked about more of the larger um, dynamics of additive manufacturing rather than a technical conversation. So uh, let's take it from there. My name is Tim Caffrey. I've been in the business of the industry of additive manufacturing for quite a long time, and I've been working with Wohler's Associates, which is a, a company uh, headquartered in Fort Collins, Colorado, since 2000. Uh, we've been doing additive manufacturing consulting before 3D printing was cool, so to speak. Uh, the industry has grown quite a bit since we started. Um, we have several people in Colorado. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas, in Northwest Arkansas, and we also have three associate consultants in uh, Europe. So a little bit about me, then I'll get out of the way. I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I got a mechanical engineering degree at the University of New Mexico there in Albuquerque. My first job out of college was with Boeing in Seattle. I started working with uh, additive manufacturing technology in 1992 while I was at Boeing. In the mid 90s, I lived in the Chicago area and I was a plant manager of what was at that time the largest installed base of additive manufacturing machines in the world. Uh, it, was, it was a large company that grew very fast and also um, lost money very fast through growth and, and ended up going bankrupt in the late 90s. <clears throat> so I also have about 25 years of writing and editing experience and copywriting. So the combination of the engineering background and the ability to write kind of is the left brain, right brain combination that I think is uh, helpful. So I know you're all probably engineering students, but it's always good to, to uh, be able to round out your engineering with uh, some, some other uh, intangible soft skills, as they call it. People often wonder what we do as consultants in the additive manufacturing industry. And if I was gonna distill what we do, I would say that we accelerate education and knowledge within our clients just by accelerating their learning curve much more. Then we also analyze trends within the industry uh, or within the particular segment or particular market that they are most interested in. And then we forecast what's gonna happen in that market for them to give them an idea of how much a, any particular segment or, or um, industry vertical is going to grow in a three to five or 10 year uh, time frame. And then finally, we also oftentimes provide roadmaps for our clients and say, well, if you really want to do A, B, and C, you need to do one, two, and three in the next three to five years. So that's essentially what we do as consultants. All right. So over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to kind of do a past, present, and future perspective on the additive manufacturing industry, starting with kind of a historical look at it, and then bringing it up to the present why is AM chosen? You know, oftentimes people say, talk about how and what, uh, but they, they oftentimes overlook why. So there's reasons why additive manufacturing is, is a, a chosen technology, and I'll go over several of them. And then finally, I'll look at the long range promise of AM technology. You know, what, what we can aspire and, and hope it can provide in an inspirational way for, for a world uh, in the future. Well, first of all, there's basically three different ways to make stuff, all right? One is subtractive, and human beings have probably been doing subtractive manufacturing since they learned to uh, first use tools. Uh, here's an example of, of, a, of a sculpture that was subtracted from a big chunk of uh, white marble back in about 1500 but by an Italian named Michelangelo. Um, the second way of making stuff is, is formative. In other words, uh, using a, a, a pouring a liquid into a form to create a three-dimensional shape. And uh, here's an example from 700 AD. It's a bronze casting. Casting has been done for about 6,000 years, perhaps longer. So human beings have been have been making things with formative technology for for quite a long time. And the third way is additive. So I was wondering if anyone would be willing to venture a guess as to how long additive uh, processes have have been uh, employed by human beings. Anybody? 20 years, 30, 30, about 30 years. 40. All right. So uh, you've been a perfect assistant, and I thank you because it's a trick question. So realistically, additive manufacturing, layer upon layer manufacturing has been around for a long, long time, just as long as those other two examples. Here we have two great examples, the, the pyramids in Egypt and the Great Wall of China, which were both 
manufactured or constructed by uh, layer by layer repeating one on top of the other, just as we describe additive manufacturing. Of course, there's some differences and uh, we'll go into those. But if we look at the construction world, we see quite a bit of layered additive manufacturing where you have courses of rocks or stones or adobe blocks, even igloos, um, bricks, you see that in architecture where a story of a high rise building is essentially a repeated layer over and over again, and the pagoda on the left. You see it even in um, uh, agriculture where people take a mountain and they, and they, cut, they cut it, until it into a, a whole bunch of level terraces. And then finally, even in food where you have a stack of pancakes or a seven layered cake or the perfectly constructed Dagwood sandwich. So uh, layered, Manufacturing has been around for a long time. Of course, there's big differences and we know it. So when we look at these paired photographs, we see in the formative side, a very complicated injection mold tool that was manufactured with uh, numerical control methods and computing and digital methods. Next to that casting, <clears throat> we see a, another example of a machine part in a CNC mill next to the carved marble piece. And with additive, it's the same thing. We see a, a, layer, a layered manufactured pyramid and then a digitally manufactured uh, additive metal part. So what are the big differences between these two pairs of photographs and, and what is really going on with, with manufacturing that, that makes the two different pairs so different? Well, it's because over the last 100 to 50 to 100 years, there's been some amazing uh, enabling technologies that have developed. You know, um, I have a brother who's six years older than me, and he's a mechanical engineer as well. And he had to learn how to use a slide rule because at the time when he entered college and started studying engineering, we didn't have handheld calculators. Now, six years later, I did not have to learn how to use a slide rule. But we're talking about the uh, mid-70s here, okay? We're not talking about a long time ago. We're talking about one generation. But in a very short period of time, we went from vacuum tubes to transistors to print circuit boards to uh, microchips, and then finally to silicon wafers that hold a whole bunch of microchips, and amazing computing power. And of course, that's led us to the ability to have handheld calculators and very powerful CAD workstations and supercomputers that can do incredible things. And all, and all of this has developed, of course, uh, over the course of my lifetime. Another enabling technology is the ability to create uh, virtual reality and create solid models or watertight volumes using CAD software. Now, when I first started working at Boeing, there wasn't any CAD software. And as a matter of fact, the, the profiles of the airplane, the profiles of the fuselage or the, or the um, aerodynamic surfaces of the wings were actually drawn or actually drawn with ink pens by drafters onto very thick sheets of mylar. And these mylar sheets were rolled up and put into a climate controlled environment so they wouldn't shrink or grow. And those sheets were actually called lofting patterns. The reason it's called lofting is because the only place in the factory that was large enough to lay out these sheets and ink them down was in the loft of the factory, okay? And up until the mid 90s, those lofting patterns were taken out and model makers would actually cut two-dimensional profiles out of plywood to create the X, Y, and Z cross sections of an airplane fuselage. And that would become the basis for the shape of the airplane. It wasn't until the, the early and mid nineties when solid modeling was really implemented in the aviation world and in the automotive industries, because those two industries had enough money to actually invest in the large mainframe computers and also the very expensive uh, workstations. Of course, now the software, the workstations and the computing power is ex much less expensive than it used to be. And it democratizes the ability to create solid models. And of course, solid models and watertight volumes are, are a critical need uh, to get to an additive manufactured part. Other enabling technologies include lasers and optics, and motion control systems, and the dispensing systems, such as ink, jet, ink jetting, and the materials that are used that have all been developed in the last uh, 30 to 40 years. Finally, we have metrology and scanning systems from, 
from digital based uh, touch probe systems to handheld 3D scanners, even the photo booths that have all of a sudden become much more prevalent. I was at a, a conference this uh, past fall in Germany and on the exhibition floor, there was there was five or six of these full size photo booths where a person or persons walk into the photo booth, stand still for a second, and there's an array of digital cameras that snap all at the same time, say 70 cameras in a circular array around the subject, and they can then create a you know, three-dimensional data set and print that using a 3D printer. The uh, digital, um, excuse me, the dentistry industry has, has gone digital almost entirely or certainly progressed in that direction. And what we see in this image on the upper right is a, uh, a cone beam CT scanner, which are very affordable so that you know dentists can purchase them now. And instead of doing the uh, physical impression of your teeth that what we used to have what, in the old days, you're getting an interoral scanner where you're getting a scan impression of your mouth and then digital dentistry just kind of falls off from there. Same thing on the lower right. This is a, a cross section of a MRI system. So we can get medical scan data, soft tissue of uh, human patients that can then be taken into the digital space where custom prosthetics and, and custom uh, uh, dental implants can then be developed. I'd like to think of 3D scanning and 3D printing as two sides of the same coin, and it's a digital coin, right? So really, when we, when we talk about all these enabling technologies and the fact that formative, subtractive, and additive technologies all have these things in common, it's, it's kind of hard to say that additive manufacturing is the, is the, uh, of the revolution, revolutionary manufacturing technology of the modern day. It's probably better to include more than just additive. So, so people often use the uh, expression advanced manufacturing, which I think is closer to the truth. But I think even, even a closer um, term is digital manufacturing. So what's really happening is we're having a, a revolution in manufacturing, and it's because it's a digital manufacturing. And of course, additive manufacturing is, is probably the, uh, uh, the poster child of digital manufacturing, because it's so new and so novel and, and so sexy that, that the uh, mainstream press and a lot of people really like talking about it. All right, how's everybody doing? I'm going to shift gears here a little bit. So why is additive manufacturing being used? You know, uh, companies don't use additive manufacturing unless there's really a reason for it. And the reason is almost 99% of the time economic. In other words, if they, if they can make something cheaper that has the same value and the same uh, functionality some other way, they will. But uh, if additive has an advantage, an inherent advantage by delivering more value or in being less expensive or some other reasons, um, then they'll probably use additive. So let's talk about why additive is being used. One is for prototyping. Obviously, uh, this is the first reason this, these technologies were developed. The whole industry was called rapid prototyping for the first 15 years of its existence. But oftentimes these days it's overlooked. You know, prototyping different models and such still represents a, a very large amount of this industry, perhaps as much as 50%. So with prototyping, you can do rapid design iteration. You can, you can print the design overnight, come back the next day, check interferences, check how it looks against the mating parts, feel it in your hand, realize what you need to change, throw it in the garbage, and then start again and make the modifications. So you can do very rapid design iterations. You don't want to fall in love with your babies. You want to throw them away and move on to the next thing so that by the time you've reached the point where your design is complete, it's a much more mature, uh, superior design by using these accelerated design cycles. It's also used for demonstration models, uh, surgical planning models. The picture on the lower right is a model of conjoined twins who shared much of the blood vasculature in their brains and they had to be separated. And this was a model that the surgical team studied prior to the surgery. So you've heard that, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words where a third, well, a three dimensional model is worth a, a thousand drawings. So once you can hold something in your hand or visualize something, it's so much easier to communicate with your team, with your sales team, with your prospective clients 
and, and move onward. And then of course there's functional prototyping where you make the part using additive, using uh, materials that are close to or equal to in functional properties, the final material. So you can actually test it uh, for thermal or cycling or other types of loading. Another reason additive manufacturing is used for part consolidation. This, this example is from NASA. It is a uh, in, inject, injector for a rocket nozzle. And what they did with additive is they consolidated 115 different parts into two parts. So you can take many simple parts that are joined together and redesign a part so that the entire assembly is a single part that doesn't require that assembly and all those fasteners. Another example comes from GE Aviation. This is the uh, fuel nozzle for the LEAP engine. There's 19 on each engine. This is a basically a fuel injector, if you will. It mixes a jet fuel with air and atomizes it and injects it into the combustion chamber of the engine. Uh, this, this part looks simple on the outside, but all of the elegance of this part is on the inside, the way the flow paths are developed. And this is a part that took 10 years to develop. But prior to this part was being developed, it used to be a combination of 18 to 20 different parts that were welded or brazed together. You can just imagine how much work went into that and how much, how many opportunities for failure uh, that were involved with that. So by consolidating all those parts, you get quite a bit of advantage. You get, a, you get a lighter weight part, you get a part that's more durable, and you get a part that's more efficient in this case. So what does part consolidation do? Here's another example from, from Boeing, from, from actually started in my days when I worked there. All of the environmental control system ducting on many of the Boeing airplanes, both commercial and um, military, uh, is now made with laser-centered nylon. So this part on the right is a, is a laser-centered nylon part that's built all in one piece. And you can see that it has the interior baffles that split the, uh, the air section and, and open areas as well. The old design was made up of many different detail parts that had to be manufactured separately, kept in inventory separately, and then assembled together in assembly operations that involved not only assembly, but also inspection and inspection paperwork. So by deleting or by um, eliminating all these different parts and different operations, you get to a single part that's complex, which eliminates a tremendous amount of um, additional costs related to those assembly lines, storage, inventory, et cetera. The third way additive manufacturing is being used is for weight reduction. This is particularly true in the aerospace industry. Uh, topology optimization is a uh, computer algorithm, which you've probably heard about, but it's, it's basically letting computing decide where to put the mass of, of a part and resulting in the least mass possible for a given loading and stiffness and, and uh, uh, condition requirements. So the part you see here in the upper left is the old bracket from, a, from an Airbus uh, door hinge. And the part in the lower left is a topology optimized part. So topology optimization w has been around for a little while, but it was more of a academic exercise because once the topology optimized geometry had been defined, it was still impossible to manufacture using conventional techniques. With additive manufacturing, it's possible to make that very bionic uh, part, that geometry that mimics uh, nature quite a bit in its, in its shape and in its uh, loading. Another way to reduce weight is to use lattice structures or mass, mesh structures in the solid area of a part. So instead of having a solid part, you have a skin, and inside the skin you have a mesh, as you see in the metal part in the lower left there. Uh, this is, again, uh, results in a part that is just as stiff and just as strong, but considerably lighter. And as I mentioned, the aerospace industry is, is the primary beneficiary of weight reduction. Perhaps the whole transportation industry benefits some, but particularly uh, for airplanes. So you know, over the course of an airplane's life, if, when you eliminate 100 kilograms of, of uh, weight from an airplane, you save a tremendous amount of money every year. Now, this is this particular number, $2.5 million, is based on short-haul airplanes. And it was from a couple of years ago when the, when the uh, price of jet fuel was probably quite different. So it may not be exact. But needless to say, over the course of, of, a, of an airplane's life, and some of these airplanes have been flying, you know, there are 727s that are flying in South America that have, that have been flying for 50 years. And they're still flying. 
and, and some of these airplanes, you know, do four or five legs a day. So it's an amazing amount of uh, uh, fuel savings related to weight reduction. Another reason to use additive manufacturing is waste reduction. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the expression buy to fly ratio, but it's, a, it's an expression used in aerospace that compares the amount of material you, have, you start with compared to the amount of material you end up with. So this particular part you see in the lower left is a bracket for the uh, um, hot side of, of the uh, joint strike fighter. And it is conventionally machined with conventional means from a solid block of titanium. The buy to fly ratio for this part is 33 to one. So you start with a big block of material and you machine 32, 30 seconds of that material away and all those scraps fall on the floor and then you end up with your part, right? So additive manufacturing gives us near net shape parts that are nearly one to one in your buy to fly ratio. And that's exactly what happened with this particular part. It was made by additive manufacturing. Here's an example of an Airbus bracket that's also hogged out of a solid block of uh, aluminum alloy. There's a one euro coin sitting on the top of that block just to give you an, a feeling for the scale. Uh, this part was instead redesigned using topology optimization and made in a metal added manufacturing powder bed fusion machine uh, out of titanium and it reduced its weight by over 50 percent. Same functionality, same stiffness, same loading. So waste reduction. Additive manufacturing allows us to make custom products, uh, one-off products or very low volume products. Co consumer goods is one example. Here's a tray full of wax-like um, patterns for jewelry that will be investment cast in precious metals. Another example is custom medical and dental devices from patient scan data. As I mentioned previously, when we were on the 3D scanning slide, um, the, the small image in the middle is a crown. And if you look where the blue arrow is, you see the metal substructure of the, of the crown, which is called a coping. Now, these copings are manufactured from scan data in additive manufacturing machines, you see them on the on the uh, right there with the support structures. EOS, the, the company that makes metal powder bed fusion systems, um, reports that they're making about 20,000 copings per day in additive machines. So to say that the dental and the orthodontic and, and uh, uh, industry has, has gone digital is it, a very true statement, uh, especially in Europe, and, and it's coming to America. You know, another reason additive is used because it has unique capabilities to be able to make parts that are so complex, they probably couldn't be made any other way. And if they could, they would be prohibitively expensive. These are a couple examples of lighting fixtures. I, I don't know how well you can see them, but they're incredibly complex. And they certainly couldn't be made in one piece. To argue that they could be made any other way, I, I guess you could, but you'd be assembling a lot of different uh, individual parts and it would, it would be incredibly expensive. Additive offers some unique capabilities. This is a hip cup manufactured on an RCAM electron beam melting machine. Now, the reason these hip cups are made, uh, it's, it's an orthopedic implant. The reason they're made using additive manufacturing is because with additive, you're able to make these very rough and porous exterior surfaces you see on this, on this part. It's called a trabecular surface. The reason, the reason for the trabecular surface is so that you get osseointegration. After this implant is, is uh, implanted into a patient, it promotes bone growth and, and it fixes the bone as it grows around the implant, fixes to the implant and it stays there much better than a smooth part. So prior to additive, the, the manufacturers of these implants used to have to do a secondary process, a chemical etching process that roughed up that surface to promote osseointegration. With additive, you can do this trabecular surface right out of the machine, and you don't you can completely skip the secondary process, thus saving a lot of money. So it's actually less expensive to make a superior part using additive than the way these, these parts were made conventionally prior. All right, so that's a quick tour of, of the reasons why additive is being used. And I want to kind of take you on a, on a personal journey, if you will. 
talking about the promise of additive manufacturing. So in the 1990s, when I was, was uh, first in this industry and, and very much involved and very much uh, engaged, we used to call it rapid prototyping. And rapid prototyping was a way of designing parts faster and getting parts, to, uh, pre reducing the cycle time of products, which actually got more products out into the market in a much faster time. One of our largest clients in, in the Chicago area was Motorola, for example. And at that time, the flip phones were coming out. And there was a new generation of flip phone being introduced every three to four months by every single one of the major manufacturers. So you know, you no sooner had bought a, a, a smartphone. Well, they weren't even smartphones then, were they? You had no sooner bought a handheld phone than it was obsolete a couple months later. So, so what we, we ended up having, we, we saw increased consumption, we saw more wasted products, and we saw an increase in planned obsolescence of products. And it was a little bit discouraging for me because I didn't necessarily see how additive was really going to make you know, the world a better place. I live, I live here in northwest Arkansas, which is Walmart country. So um, I kind of describe this phenomenon a little bit as the Walmartization of, of commerce where you make a whole bunch of really cheap stuff. You stack it deep and you sell it cheap, right? So there was a lot of offshoring, a lot of, a lot of manufacturing went to China, obviously. And we're talking about just um, not very good global resource management. Let's put it that way, right? Well, today, uh, I think things have changed. I think things have, have improved quite a bit in terms of what additive manufacturing uh, has to promise. Uh, we call it additive manufacturing now, or 3D printing, and what it what it allows to, us to do with with the ability of um, design iteration and simultaneous design iterations, where you can have more than one team working on it on a product and developing it, and then selecting down selecting to the uh, superior product toward the end, you end up with much more mature and sophisticated product designs that have fewer tool modifications, fewer engineering changes once, once a part is uh, put out into the marketplace and fewer product recalls because these, these are fully matured, well-designed parts. So that leads to reduced waste and it also re leads to uh, reduction in, in obsolescence of products because the products aren't junk. They're not something that's gonna be replaced by something better in the short term. Uh, hopefully they're products that are gonna last long and the consumer can get a full value out of those products. It also leads to uh, additive allows us to lead to a more distributed on-demand manufacturing, where instead of having to set up a tool that costs $150,000 and injecting 200,000 parts to even justify that capital cost of the tool, and then warehousing all those parts and hoping that they're gonna get sold somewhere, and then trucking them all the way across the country to distribution points, you actually have the ability to build parts and build products and create products as they're needed and no faster. You don't have to tie them up in inventory. And you can also build them in a distributed network of manufacturing facilities. And finally, what we've got is a democratized opportunity. You know, it, it was very difficult for uh, people with limited budgets to break into manufacturing 20 years ago because it was so expensive from a capital cost standpoint to actually go into production of products. Now with additive, you can actually go into a very limited production run of a variety of different products, figure out, without putting out a huge amount of capital on tooling, then figure out what product, if any, is the most popular, and then start to produce those and maybe even tool for that product if, if it makes sense. And the products that aren't successful, you can just stop making them. You don't waste a huge amount of uh, inventory. You don't waste a huge amount of capital. And you don't tie up all that capital in, uh, in tooling and, and uh, inventory. So that's where we are today. So, so how do I see the future uh, of, of additive manufacturing and, and in, indeed digital manufacturing in general. I think that w hopefully in the future we'll see better, smarter, longer lasting products that are made using sustainable, low waste and low energy consumption methods. So uh, in, in a resource starved world, which, which you know is becoming increasingly obvious that that's the case, um, this will be an aid uh, for us to move forward into the 
latter half of this century. So anyway, those are just some of my thoughts. Um, if you walk away with anything, think of AM as part of the digital manufacturing revolution. It's not going to replace conventional manufacturing. It's going to coexist in the factory of the future with other digital manufacturing techniques that have been around just as long. And the reason that these techniques have come so far is because we've, there's been so many enabling technologies that have developed in the last 50 to 100 years, computing power, software, and then other things like lasers and scanning and other high-tech developments. AM is used because it, it is great for prototyping and product design, for part consolidation, for weight and waste reduction, and for complex and custom parts. And finally, the promise of AM technology is better products in a resource-starved future. And that wraps it up. So I don't know if we have any time for uh, any questions and answers, um, but I'd be happy to take some. Thank you. Um, earlier in uh, your PowerPoint, you said that um, you had a lot of previous experience with copyright. Is there any risk of um, the new additive technologies creating any uh, making it easier for people to infringe on others' copyrights by just printing off a part instead of buying one? Is that a risk at all? Well, first of all, um, I have to clear up. Copywriting is actually a term used in marketing and um, advertising for someone who writes. <laughs> so it's two different kinds of copywriting we're talking about here. Um, but I, I can still um, consider your question. Yeah, certainly there's there's um, an issue with copyright. There hasn't been a precedent established in the courts yet uh, that lawyers can say, well, this is this is the actual precedent. This is the way it's going to be. Um, designs can still be copyrighted, um, and copyrights can always be infringed as as they are all the time. So, uh, with a proper uh, patent portfolio, for example. Or, or copyright of a part, there's no reason why the existing copyright laws can't be applied to the digital world and um, successfully applied. But I think that that exercise of running through the entire court system to prove that hasn't happened yet. So um, I've been waiting for that to happen over the last several years because that question comes up and we say, well, there's probably going to be some kind of a Lit litigation that's going to occur in the not too distant future that will help us to sort all this out, but but it hasn't happened yet. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.